All right, our next speaker, another friend of mine, uh, Sterling Cooley, uh, CEO of Vegas Hub and uh, director of Ultra Dow. He'll tell us what it is. Using ultrasound to modify enzymatic activity for future therapeutic in interventions. Sterling. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, I'll hold it, I'll hold it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Wow, I'm so nervous. Wow. Oof. Uh, well, thanks, Gino. Um, well, thank you guys for coming to my talk today. I'm going to be kind of doing a, a little bit of a further deep dive into some of the potential targets that ultrasound is having in the body. Um, due to some of my work in stimulating the human vagus nerve, it's my suspicion, and we'll show some research here, that part of what ultrasound is doing is modifying enzymatic activity, which, is, which has some pretty big implications for therapeutic interventions, as Stuart was saying. So uh, let's see if this works. OK. So you can see the key points here. But I'm going to try and keep this a little short, because I also actually have an ultrasound here with me. And I am going to do a demo on stage. That's why I moved a chair here. So I'm going to ask for a few volunteers. So anybody who's adventurous, I'll yeah, keep track of who wants to try. Uh, this is a vagus nerve stimulator for the ear. OK, I got it. Um, we'll do that after my presentation, though, because I did do some work on this. Um, so generally speaking, what we do find in this middle point is that ultrasound doesn't have consistent effects. Ultrasound on the brain or ultrasound in peripheral neurons is not consistent all the time. Sometimes it causes an increase in neural activity, and sometimes it causes a decrease in neural activity as well. So that's an unexplained aspect of it that's not totally clear. So in some of the stuff that we're going to look at, we're going to look at some explanation for why there's that disparity between sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, and sometimes it does nothing. And I think it's based on some of these enzymatic reactions. So basically, what I'm hoping to get across here today is that a lot of the therapeutic interventions for Alzheimer's disease and dementia involve enzymatic modification of acetylcholine esterase as an enzyme to increase levels of acetylcholine in the brain, thereby giving somebody another maybe five years of not having Alzheimer's. So we see something very similar in how ultrasound affects the same target, the same enzymatic target. So um, enzymes regulate neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, et cetera. They regulate, there's thousands of them in your body. They're of differing sizes and different functions. Um, so we actually think that based on some of the research here, uh, is that ultrasound is in large part functional because of its effect on enzymes. And I'll show you how I got to this information. Um, so in the mid-1960s, they actually already had one megahertz ultrasound devices, which is pretty high for that time. Um, and they found that when they did extraction of blood serum, that it would have an effect on acetylcholine esterase. That was an, a measured, measurable effect from an ELISA enzyme test. Um, so that's exactly the same drug, galantamine, does that, how does this little thing work? That right there, galantamine is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitory drug used as a treatment for uh, m uh, mild to moderate stages of Alzheimer's disease, okay? So ultrasound does the same thing as one of the top drugs, galantamine, for treating Alzheimer's. So there's a potential therapeutic intervention right there. And that's from the 1960s. Now, in the mid-1980s, this work looked at ultrasound as a tool to extract different proteins in food. So this is called, like, food enzyme kinetics. It's a very interesting area. So they tried sweeping frequencies from 1 to 11 uh, for alpha amylase. And they found that at 7.8 mega or 7.6 megahertz right there, I'm not looking at my thing here, 7.6 is that they had a 200% increase in enzymatic activity at that one frequency alone. But here's the thing, here's the problem. A lot of the ultrasound that's 
available commercially is in orders of 500 kilohertz, 1 megahertz, 2, 4, 8, and 10. But if you have 7.6, how are you going to find that? I mean, that's a, that's a potential, if you're running a business that produced food, and I said, you're going to get a 200% increase in that enzyme, they'd say, sign me up. If we could do the same thing for how the brain works and how enzymes are working, I'd say sign me up too. So uh, now if we look into the early 2000s, this work continued. They looked at, you know, trying to extract is ultrasound affecting conformational activity of enzymes? Is it not? Whatever. Um, and so they found that even at very low frequencies of ultrasound in the diagnostic range, because most people are thinking, well, this is... Food technology is high frequency, high intensity ultrasound. That's just, you know, changing temperature. But they found that minus temperature modifications, they still had an effect. And that's what they found in the early 2000s. And then if we move to pretty much the present moment, um, right now, ultrasound is an emerging technology in food enzyme uh, inactivation, right? So they're using ultrasound to affect how yogurt is made, how cheese is made, how they process uh, oat milk. I'm a big fan of oat milk instead of dairy. So in all this plant-based food, um, they're using ultrasound in large part. And they are the pioneers in this enzymatic reaction exploration. So I think that we can learn a lot from the food processing industry to understand what are the therapeutic impl implications for ultrasound on enzymes. So in part, that's basically where I think we are right now, is that in order to get full regulatory approval, we're going to have to basically take a drug discovery approach to ultrasound from the perspective of if we can show that ultrasound affects acetylcholine esterase exactly as an already approved FDA drug for Alzheimer's, then we have a pathway to therapeutic approval. That's my proposition. Uh, currently, we also have a lab up in uh, University of Washington in Bothell with a lab that can do this research in high throughput screening of enzymes with ultrasound, with some of the biggest ultrasound uh, manufacturers in the world right now. So uh, if you do want to get involved, the next page will show that. So we do have a website, ultradow.to. You can go there, um, remember it. DAO basically stands for a distributed autonomous organization. So it's more of an open source project rather than a C Corp. Um, also, I would recommend that you do try Jay Sanguinetti's ultrasound, whatever it takes. Get to his lab and try it. It is very cool. Um, you know, obviously, shout out to all the incredible people here. Follow me on Twitter if you want to get more information. Um, special thanks to everybody who made this uh, event possible. This is literally the culmination of like, decades and decades of work. So it's amazing that we're all here. So, um, so anyway, I don't want to go down all the lists, but thank you everybody on this and more. Um, so now what I'd like to do is a quick demonstration uh, or a demo of actual ultrasound on the vagus nerve. So uh, raise your hand if you want to be a, a test subject. Uh, let's start with Patrick. Let's have you come up here. Um, if it's safe, yeah, let's have you walk the safe way. Don't want any liabilities of you falling. Um, okay, so. So what we have here is a commercial grade uh, ultrasound. It plugs in. Just kind of basically set it up really quick. There we go. All right, so he has done this already today. So he actually knows the tricks. All right, so we're gonna apply some ultrasound gel right here to the transducer. And then if you would, please place it on. All right, and so while he puts that on, I'll just kind of describe what's going on. So uh, this transducer is actually pulsing out at eight megahertz. Eight megahertz is a very interesting frequency because it has some uh, bio effects on the vagus nerve in particular. How do we know that? We tried many different frequencies. Uh, back when I started ultrasound, I developed a platform where you could sweep through thousands of frequencies. And actually, I want to, on your bond is not here, unfortunately, but at one of the uh, Science of Consciousness events that Stuart ran back in like 2016, I think, I actually went up to on your bond and I said, hey, we have an ultrasound here. What frequency would you like to put on it? And he's like, hmm, 3.71 megahertz pulsed at 2700 hertz with a 60% like 
on off rate at a 10% duty cycle. He gave me some like really incredible like thing. I was like, how did you think of that? He's like, oh, it's a triplet thing. I'm like, okay, sure, on your bond. So I plugged it in and we tried it. And later that night at the presidential suite, we had some like 50 people that tried it and they're like, holy shit, the effects are amazing. Definitely different than one megahertz or 500 or two or three or four, but 3.7 was one of these frequencies that literally is, if you watched On Your Bond's talk, it was, he, he figured that out from his work. So there's a, there's a huge transference, oops, what was that? Oh, there's a huge transference of some of the work that On Your Bond's doing, some of the work that enzymatic researchers are doing, and then I think in terms of practical ability, um, Fortunately, since we can go through the vagus nerve, which is under the skin and not through the skull, you can play with, play with frequencies up to from one megahertz to 28 to 100 megahertz. There's no, there's no skull that sits in the way. And you know, nobody gave a talk about the vagus nerve, but I'll try to give you a little summary. It's a pretty incredible nerve. Um, it runs through the entire body. Um, and Patrick is probably in a pretty, uh, state of parasympathetic bliss right now, so. Um, but I would like to um, actually see if, if, would you be comfortable sharing what you've experienced so far? Sure. Okay, cool, here you go. Um, so, there's an effect uh, right about a few seconds after putting the ultrasound on, and um, it's slightly euphorizing. Um, it, there's a, f a feeling of um, a slight expansiveness. Mm. And there's um, some feeling of warmth. Um, yeah, it's like it's stimulating uh, for me now. Yeah, good feeling. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks so much, Patrick. Appreciate it. Cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, usually we want to do be one to two to three minutes with stimulation. We don't want to go any more longer than that. Thank you so much. Here, can I? Okay. Uh, all right. That's fine. Um, do we have? I don't know if we have time, but maybe one more person. One person that I've not talked to wants to. One more. One more is cool. Okay. Um, let's try you right here. Right up here in the front. What's uh, What's your name? Susan. Susan. Okay. Uh, if you can safely get up this way, I think you you look. You look rather athletic, so, okay, cool. So, same process, all right? So I'll, I'll uh, put it on your head and we'll get it going. So we're gonna apply a little bit of ultrasound gel right here. Always need some ultrasound gel. Then what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna place yeah. it right here, right auricular vagus nerve. There we go, there we go, okay, right there. All right, okay. Can you show us where that is before we're Yes. Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll explain where I've placed it. So, 10th cranial nerve, vagus nerve. It runs down your left side and your right side. I do a lot of work with the vagus nerve too, by the way, so I know this pretty well. But in your ear, there's a branch that goes up through your concha. So right about in this area, can you guys see this okay? Probably should have gotten a big picture of it, but just Google it. But right here in the ear, on the right side, just Google the concha, C-O-N-C-H-A, uh, and that's the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. That's part of your afferent branch of the vagus nerve, meaning vagus nerve generally sends signals up and down to your body. So this only stimulates upwards into the brain stem. So it does affect autonomic activity. Um, and generally speaking, our theory here is that we are modulating the levels of acetylcholine through enzymatic reactions and boosting it natively in the brain. So if she did this right before bed, she would probably notice that she fell asleep very quickly, went very deeply into sleep, and typically what we see, which is a, also an exact side effect of galantamine, the uh, Alzheimer's drug, is that people who are sleep lucid dreamers professionally take galantamine to boost acetylcholine so that they can have lucid dreams. So every time we do ultrasound on the vagus nerve, their very first night, they're like, holy shit, I had the most vivid dreams I've ever had. Super lucid, super vivid. So that's another kind of like mini validation that that's happening. But we do know that it does boost acetylcholine. So you've had a few minutes on this. Do you want to give your feedback? Good, bad, otherwise, I'm, I, we've never met before. Too. Yeah, no, it's first time. Um, so 
I definitely felt just more at peace. Um, I also know my pretty self pretty well, and my body usually does a release, and that was I felt my head just kind of unwinding, like okay, yeah, it's definitely having a noticeable effect. Um, just more peaceful, warm, fuzzy feeling. And like I noticed the lights, the ultraviolet lights more over here became more clear. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Can I take that off of you too? All right. And I'm sorry I didn't bring any uh, napkins up, but you'll just want to kind of wipe off the, the gel there. Um, I don't know if I have time for questions. I'm probably... I do? Okay, cool. Is there, does anybody have any questions? Like right up back here with the, the vest on, the safari vest. Yeah, right. <laughs> All of them. Uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. And I'm, I'm just wondering uh, if, if you get numbers in the, in, in, in the mega, megahertz. So mm. if, if you take the sound wave in water, I think this velocity could be around 1,000 meters per second. Yeah. And you divide it by about a millimeter, which could be roughly the, the diameter of, of whatever you're dealing with. Yeah. Then you get around a million, which would set up a standing wave, perhaps, and that's me meaning there's a relationship between the geometry and the speed so to see what, what kind of frequency, why is it a million? I mean, th there's a reason for the, you, you discover a certain range of frequencies that is effective, but there will be a reason for it. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's, a good, it's a good point. Um, so the, the higher the frequency, the, the smaller the target area gets, basically. So if you think of like a, if you were able to visualize a standing wave, like a low, like a wah, would be like big waves in this room. The higher the frequency, boop, the, the smaller the wave gets from peak to trough. So when we're at eight megahertz, you know, we're, it's actually pretty large, but when we're at, gosh, like 150 megahertz, which is possible, that is technology that exists, and this can be miniaturized very easily, then you get even more targeting. But Still, there are, as we saw with the research with, on enzymes, is that there still is an effect. Um, and I believe it's a conformational change in the enzyme. The enzyme has to be a certain size for that to happen. Um, but that's, that's, again, that's work that we're doing up in uh, University of Washington in Bothell to do high throughput screening. You know, let's do thousands of generations of this and find out where's the peak and where's the trough. So, great question. Um, I don't know if I actually, he's, yeah, okay. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, cool. I guess I knocked out all questions. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I'll hand it back over to, to Stu. Thank you, Stu. Yeah, thank you very much. All right.